And if you do go intravenously on your first shot, go with a one milliliter cerebralizant administration over a five minute injection intravenously to see if you have any kind of negative effect. And to further drive that point home for you guys, on average, a nasal spray delivers about 0.1 milliliters per pump, 0.1 milliliters per spray. So you get about 21.52 milligrams cerebralized in peptide fragments and free amino acids per serving. But that also means you need to administer 80 pumps, 80 sprays, 80 sprays per day uh, to get your eight milliliters in <laughs> if you're a 100 kilogram bodybuilder. So that basically means you need to bump every 12 minutes. Yeah, and I'm sure that sounds familiar to you guys. It sounds familiar to me, but that uh, part of my life is long behind me. There are some instances of minor to severe allergic reactions to cerebralycin, known as a porcine allergy, which partially stem from an immunoglobulin E mediated response. But these adverse effects are mostly observed when cerebralycin is administered intravenously. So religious reasoning aside, if you know you have an allergy to pork meat or gelatin products for that matter, then I would avoid cerebralycin altogether and skip to the part where I discuss cortexin as a replacement. Before you do any kind of intravenous or intramuscular cerebralycin administration, please go with a conservative route and inject 0.1 milliliters cerebralycin subcutaneously to assess your response if you get post-injection pain, redness at the site of administration, or you get some sort of an indication of anaphylactic shock, that obviously means that an intramuscular or intravenous cerebralizin administration is not for you. And please be patient. Please give yourself at least 24 hours for any kind of negative effect to manifest. If after one or two days you don't get any post-injection pain, irritation at the site of administration or other kinds of complications following the 0.1 milliliters cerebralized and subcutaneous injection, then you can proceed to 0.1 to 1 milliliter cerebralized by intramuscular injection to assess for a similar response, right? Post-injection pain, irritation at the site of administration or redness or anaphylactic shock. Again, it could still occur a switching from subcutaneous or intramuscular administration if you suffer from a porcine allergy. So take it slow, take it step by step and assess day by day or with two day breaks in between uh, if you have an allergic response to your cerebralized injections before, <laughs> before you do anything intravenously. And if you do go intravenously on your first shot, go with a one milliliter cerebralized administration over a five minute injection intravenously to see if you have any kind of negative effect. Because if you go halfway through your injection over two and a half minutes of 0.5 milliliters, and then you start to get symptoms of anaphylactic shock, then at least you're halfway there and you can abort and uh, ride it out if, and only if you have an EpiPen on standby. You might need a hefty dose of epinephrine, AKA adrenaline to get you out of this adverse reaction as fast as possible. If you go with intravenous injections, please guys, please use either a butterfly catheter needle or a silicone catheter to prevent any kind of arterial damage and scarring. Assuming you don't get an autoimmune response from one milliliter cerebralized intravenously, then you can proceed to the dose that you're after, dilute it into at least 100 milliliters normal saline solution and administer it over the course of 15 minutes to 60 minutes. And again, if you go with a higher dose of cerebralizin, let's say 50 milliliters intravenously, please dilute that into a 500 milliliter normal saline solution concoction, and then take your sweet time and administer that uh, intravenously with a silicone catheter. And before I forget, Benadryl and Zantac might be able to prevent any development of immunoglobulin E antigens. These can be used preventatively before each intravenous cerebralycin infusion. And with that out of the way, let's get into whether cerebralycin treatments can cause Prown's disease or not. Prown's are infectious proteins which can cause fatal neurodegenerative complications known as Prown's disease. Prown's can be transmitted through the contact of infected tissues, contaminated medical equipment, even by eating infected meat or by injecting animal-based peptide extracts. Prions cause disease by converting normal cellular prion proteins into the abnormal infectious form. This misfolded protein then aggregates and damages brain tissue, leading to symptoms like memory loss, personality changes, and movement problems. Now, I don't consider jazz hands to be movement problems, but I'm sure you guys will let me know down below in the comment section whether I have Prions disease or not. These diseases, also called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, include Crutchfield-Jacobs disease in humans, 
bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow's disease in cattle and scrapie in sheep. There's no scientific evidence that cerebral acid is associated with Brown's disease. If there was some sort of cover-up within Mother Russia and other countries where cerebral acid is FDA approved for particular medical treatments, at one point or another, after decades and decades and decades of cerebral acid uh, administrations in human patients, you would figure that uh, an instance of Brown's disease would come to the forefront at one point in time or another. Uh, but I couldn't find any indication that cerebral acid contains Brown's in the two studies which investigated the peptide fragments and the free, free amino acids which are contained within cerebral lysin. So I hope that puts your mind at ease somewhat. That being said though, any product derived from animal tissues contain a theoretical risk of contributing to prions disease if it's not properly processed to eliminate these infectious proteins. And for your information, you can also get prions from human cadaver pituitary extracted growth hormone formulations, which didn't seem to stop the bodybuilders from using it up until the mid 1980s. And before we get into the cerebralisin dosing protocols, let's briefly compare the efficacy of cerebralisin to the efficacy of cortexin, which is a complex of low molecular weight, water soluble polypeptide fragments derived from the cerebral cortex of calves. Unfortunately, the large majority of the studies comparing cerebral lysin to cortexin are in Russian and not available as a full publication. Wherever possible, I extrapolated some information from the abstract, translating Russian into English, but there might be some conjecture here due to the lack of fully translated publications. Still, I did my absolute best to group and aggregate all of the information I could find comparing cerebral lysin to cortexin. So here we go. The investigated dosage ranges from animal models using mice with cerebralisin that was 0.8 milliliters, 2.5 milliliters, or 7.5 milliliters per one kilogram of body weight daily for two 10-day courses with a 10-day treatment break in between those two 10-day courses or daily for up to four weeks in duration. And in these studies, the investigated dosage ranges for cortexin were 0.3 milligrams, one milligram, or three milligrams per one kilogram of body weight daily for the exact same treatment duration. And it's only fair if you compare cerebralisin to cortexin with the exact same treatment treatment protocols and the investigated dosage ranges using rats as an animal model are basically one on one. So the exact same dose between cerebralisin and cortexin. So there was either one microgram, 10 micrograms or 100 micrograms cerebralisin or cortexin administered through intraventricular infusion, which is an injection directly into the brain's fluid filled ventriculars, also known as an intracerebral ventricular administration. And converting that to the human equivalent dose using Doscal, which is always linked down below in case you want to do your own conversions. The human equivalent dose of cerebralisin will be between 0.06 milliliters to 0.61 milliliters per one kilogram of body weight. And for cortexin, that will be 0.02 milligrams to 0.24 milligrams per one kilogram of body weight in both instances daily. So again, that would mean a 100 kilogram bodybuilder would have to take up to 61 milliliters cerebralisin or go up to 24 milligrams cortexin based on these animal models where the maximum efficacious effects were generally observed at the higher dosage ranges. The mechanism of action for cerebralisin, it crosses the blood brain barrier with an unknown uptake and offers neurotropic like effects. And with cortexin, it also crosses the blood brain barrier with a six to 8% uptake. It acts in AMPA, kinate, mglur1, GABA-A1 and mglur5 receptors. And cortexin offers glutaminergic and GABAergic modulation. Now comparing the beneficial effects regarding neurological recovery and memory formation, with cerebralisin, it offers superior improvement after embolic stroke and comparable improvements after acute and eczemic stroke or chronic eczemia. And with cortexin, again, it offers comparable improvements after acute eczemic stroke and chronic eczemia. So in this context, for embolic stroke, cerebralisin seems to be superior. When comparing lesion volume reduction, cerebralisin offered no significant reduction in lesion volume, but cortexin reduced necrotic tissue size. When comparing cerebral blood flow, um, either compound, whether it was cerebralisin or cortexin, had no effect on cerebral blood flow whatsoever. Regarding antioxidant activity, cerebralisin has a dose-dependent antioxidant effect, but cortexin has a superior dose-dependent antioxidant effect. Regarding cytoprotective effects, comparing cerebralisin to cortexin, cerebralisin exhibits cytoprotective properties on T and B lymphocytes, favors survival of immunocompetent cells, and stimulates immune memory B lymphocyte proliferation. 
but cortexin was shown to have cytotoxic and anti-proliferative effects on T lymphocytes. So regarding cytoprotective effects and the effects on the immune system, cerebralicin wins. And regarding behavioral effects, cerebralicin was shown to have moderate psychostimulant action, but cortexin has more effective psychostimulant action. The adverse effects are minimal uh, regarding the differences in safety profile, but since both compounds are derived from animal tissue, both compounds could potentially contribute to prion's disease, albeit, again, in both instances, whether that's cerebralicin or cortexin, no scientific evidence that these compounds are associated with prion's disease. And when we're comparing the therapeutic effects from price to dose, it seems that cerebralicin is less efficacious after eczemic stroke, whereas cortexin is more efficacious after eczemic stroke. So regarding the outcome of the study, Cortexin is more beneficial when you compare that to the cost. Now, however, this is coming from a Russian study stemming from 2006. So that's well, almost 20 years ago and the full publication isn't available. So here's the too long didn't read. Cerebralicin is superior to resolve stroke and has a positive effect on the immune system, while cortexin has superior antioxidant effects, reduces narcotic tissue and is more effective in psychostimulation and might be a little bit more cost effective when we're comparing prices. Using some highly dubious extrapolation from these studies where the results of cerebralizing treatment are very comparable to the results of cortexin treatment, I have to conclude that 10 milligrams lyophilized cortexin equals about 25 milliliters of liquid cerebralizing. And that being said, after 60 days, yes, 60 days consecutively, either 5 milliliters to 10 milliliters cerebralizing intramuscularly before bed daily, I did not notice any beneficial effect switching from up to 10 milliliters cerebralizing to 10 milligrams cortexin intramuscularly before bed for another 20 days after this initial 60 day cerebralizing treatment, uh, which you could consider to be two and a half to five times the dose of cerebralizing I was running before, right? 10 mil up to 10 milliliters cerebralizing is still two and a half times lower than the 10 milligrams cortexin dose I would take daily for 20 days afterwards. I did not notice a beneficial effect on top of the beneficial effects I experienced from 60 days on cerebralizing by continuing and switching to cortexin for another 20 days. Now, this is, again, an end of one anecdotal experience. I would not know if I uh, would have started with cortexin if the beneficial effects would have manifested on a 2.5 milligram to 5 milligram cortexin dose. I guess I'll never know because the next time I'll run cerebralizin or cortexin, we're talking about a couple years ahead because I feel that these courses have very long lasting effects. So based on this ratio, which I got from the scientific evidence, where 10 milligrams cortexin being around nine and a half dollars and 25 milliliters cerebralizin being around $70, excluding discounts and shipping fees, I would have to agree with the 2006 study where cortexin has a more favorable dose to price ratio, albeit that I can't vouch for its efficacy because again, I did not notice anything after the initial 60 days on cerebralicin. Now I'm sure you guys will let me know down below in the comment section that you would like to see a cortexin deep dive in the near future, uh, right after I finish a boatload of other deep dives, which are currently pending. Um, so uh, if you want to speed up that process, give me a little bit of incentive, share this cerebralizing deep dive video with all of your nootropic loving friends, bring the views up by putting a boatload of comments, a couple likes and sharing this all across the internet. And then I feel a little bit more incentivized to uh, get started on the Cortex and Deep Dive. Uh, so you guys know exactly what to expect in case you don't want to run Shribalizin after watching this deep dive or through religious reasons or Brown's disease, you're a little bit turned off of the idea of injecting purified pig brains.